talk uh, after morning tea um, is by Anthony Stell and uh, the title is um, oh, oh there it is a virtual research environment for international adrenal cancer research uh, NSAT cancer is that right way to say it um, Anthony is a clinical software developer at the Melbourne e research group I assume that means Melbourne University Research Group, yes. yes. Uh, he holds an MSc in Information Technology from the University of Glasgow, uh, Master of Physics Honours in Astrophysics from the University of Edinburgh and is a Chartered IT Professional at the British Computing Society. He has previously been the Glasgow representative of the UK Grid Engineering Task Force, one of the lead developers on the EUFP7 Avert IT project an initiative to create a high potensive event prediction system through the collection of real physiological data from specialist neurosurgery centres around Europe. That's brilliant. And is now the senior developer for the NSAT Cancer Project, a distributed digital repository and biobanking project specialising in the linkage of information and samples concerning rare adrenal tumours in Europe. Anthony, please. Thank you very much for that. Okay, there we go. Uh, yes, so uh, that introduction cancels out my first slide pretty much. My name is Anthony Sedell. Uh, I'll talk about an e -research, a clinical e-research application that we're working on at the University of Melbourne. Um, it's, I've called it here a digital registry for adrenal tumours, a very rare type of tumour um, that is given to this sort of distributed problem. Uh, so I will dive right in and tell you all about it. Basically, first thing to describe is the problem space, uh, and that is the types of adrenal cancer that we're um, dealing with, the sort of uh, clinical conditions that we're trying to gather data on. Um, four very highly medical terms that um, not expecting people to memorise, but um, they vary in different uh, types of uh, malignancy and severity. Um, but basically, they're on the adrenal glands. Here's a picture of the kidneys with the adrenal glands above them. I've spared you actual proper photos of real uh, adrenal glands, which I have seen an awful lot of since I've been on this project. Um, but from as a computer programmer approaching this problem, uh, the sort of severity was kind of underlined when I came across this issue. Uh, what I've got here is a summary of the records and types of information that we collect on this registry. Um, and when I first put this together, uh, I go and interrogate the database with some SQL query. And it brings back information like uh, the amount of records that are in there, the number of patients that are live. So we've got follow-up data that tells you how many patients have succumbed to their illness. And when I first presented this summary table, that bottom figure was around 980 compared to about 1,000 records that we had in there. I presented this to the clinicians and they said that number is way too high. You've got a bug in your code. And sure enough, I went away, redone, redid the query and put it back correctly and the number dropped. And they said that's a far more realistic number for this type of tumour. So the credentials of this being a serious disease are established that way for me. So just how rare are these rare diseases? So pheochromocytoma, which is one type of the four, um, for every million people in a population, you will get roughly two to eight patients. Um, so it's that rare. Um, and also, I've worked, as I said in my bio, I've worked in other sort of clinical projects, um, largely from the UFP7 initiatives. And they have the same sort of route. So this is a project that feeds into other types of rare disease platforms, um, such as disorders of sexual development. Uh, where children are born that are neither male nor female because of chromosomal or genetic abnormalities and other conditions like Alstrom, Wolfram's and bardet beetle which as I understand are serious, serious forms of diabetes. Um, and these are incredibly rare as well, not just because the condition is rare, but for instance with uh, Alstrom, uh, sufferers normally don't even survive to beyond their teenage years. So the amount of information that is out there um, is not a lot, which is why we're putting this project together to try and gather the sparse information that is out there. 
I went recently to the International Symposium on Pheochromous Cytoma uh, in Paris in September, though, and uh, there was roughly about 1,000 attendees. So that was a big conference. Uh, a lot of people there, a lot of doctors, clinicians, uh, data providers, IT support, and patients as well. Um, so again, the point of these projects is not just to provide the IT infrastructure, but to get people meeting and discussing and exchanging information on a human basis. So ENSA, the network itself, the, the basis of this, is called the European Network for the Study of Adrenal Tumors. Um, and it started life in around about 2004 uh, with four countries, France, Italy, Germany, and the UK. Um, it's grown since then. Uh, I think the main countries involved special centers from Spain and the Netherlands. But this is a very sort of Western European skewed map. Um, there are contributors wanting to contribute now that our project is sort of started up and is being used for real um, from places like Hungary and Bulgaria uh, in more Eastern Europe. And their method of data distribution until actually we got involved in 2009 was that they would put their data and their spreadsheets on CDs and they would post them, courier them to each other. Um, so, you know, people are always wanting quick wins in a project. We showed up and said, hey guys, there's this thing called the internet um, and we can, you know, create an application that allows you not to have to post these things and have data get lost in the post or whatever. So that is the NSAT network. What I am actually talking about is the NSAT Cancer Project. Um, and that is an EU FP7 funded project. Five years duration. It started in January 2011. I think it's roughly 38 million euros. I'm not sure. I'm a techie. Don't bother about such things. Um, but the goals are digital linkage and harmonization. So you've got da these distributed data silos you want to bring them together into sort of one big unified and harmonious kind of data storage system. Uh, information exchange systems, you want to set things up not just to exchange clinical data, but biosamples, imaging data, all that kind of thing as well. And the sort of umbrella term that we've uh, called this is a virtual research environment. I'll go into this a bit more. Uh, but basically, it's not just a single web application. We're looking at different studies. We're looking at um, ways to, you know, create the network and make it grow beyond just the IT that underpins it. But that's why we're here, and that's what we're interested in. So here is the registry that we have built as part of this project. Uh, if you go to this URL, HTTPS registry.nsat.org um, and you log in and you have a membership to the NSAT network and I've granted you a login. Um, you get to a summary page that shows things like um, the records, the patient, the number of patients alive, I've shown this already at the beginning, um, interesting metrics that clinicians are interested in like a uh, number of biosamples, uh, biomaterial forms, what type of biomaterials held at all the different centers. Um, clinical annotations, so how many follow-up forms, surgery forms, pathology forms have been created and used uh, in this registry. And also other metrics like clinical annotations per patient, biosamples per patient, um, and active centers as well, which leads into this bottom uh, table, which actually shows you a list of all the centers around Europe. And we've set it up into a league table, so this kind of engenders a bit of friendly competition um, to say, you know, this center is contributing the most records, you can do better, you know, put other stuff in, try and compete. And I think there was discussion of prizes for, <laughs> you know, the most number of records, but perhaps not, I don't know. Um, but they are split into the four different types as well um, of tumor. So when you log in and go beyond that sort of summary page and lead tables and stuff, what you've got here are a list of records um, that gives you the basic core information for every patient. So you've got an NSAT ID, which is non-identified, um, things like names and uh, full date of birth are not stored in this registry for security reasons that I'll talk about later. Uh, but you've got things like date of first registration, uh, sex, year of birth, um, the consent level obtained for sharing information within the group and within the registry. Um, and if you've got appropriate privileges, you can look at the details, edit the details, delete things, uh, check out status reports. You can do an individual search for patients uh, along the top bar there. And you can also filter it based on, you can see your patients in your center or the patients in your country or all the patients and you'll see different levels of privilege of that based on what privilege you've been assigned. 
So that's the core information, but what's more interesting to clinicians is the sort of subsidiary forms. So how many surgeries has a patient had? How many pathological slides have they looked at? Um, all that kind of thing. Um, Follow-up is very important as well. You know, has the patient been regularly seen uh, at regular intervals since they um, received treatment or had surgery or whatever? That's an example of one of these forms that they fill in. So you have the surgery date, the type of surgery, the method, the extent, um, and the reception status, you know, how many surgeries have they had, uh, etc. And also a very important thing that's only recently been put in is this little summary status report. So what that shows you is the NSAT stage of the tumour, which is a classification that basically says, you know, how bad is this tumour? Um, and you've got summary stats like when, how old were they when they were first diagnosed? When was the last follow-up? What's their survival time? Are they alive? Um, and if at the bottom here it says it does not have R0 resection status, which means it's had more than one surgery. Um, and if that's the case, then there'd be more follow-up trending information. So from this, we can gather statistical information. And this is one of the things that the clinicians are very hot on. They really want to know what treatments are working, what isn't, etc. <laughs> So that's one side of it. There are more features we'll go into here. Uh, it's a different color. I don't know if you can see that, but that's because it represents pheochromocytoma this time instead of the ACC, uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma type of tumor. Uh, this is a read-only snapshot, so the person that is trying to see the information here, they can read it, but they can't edit anything. Um, and that just gives you an idea of the different types of privilege that you can see. Another feature, I'll talk about the studies in a following slide, but if you want to flag a patient and say this patient is really, they've got all the criteria we need for a particular study, then you can flag that, set that in the database, and the relevant people get an email. So what you see there is uh, it's going to uh, Professor V. Carl in Birmingham because she's the lead uh, on the Uranax study. Um, it's going to myself to check out that IT is all working and to Felix Bushman in, in Munich because uh, he's the lead PI on the NSAT cancer project. We've got a search function as well, so you can search the registry and here we want to pick out all the female patients in a particular centre in Germany and it comes back saying there are 448 records, gives you a summary status there. Uh, then you can do a compound search of the follow-on forms that says I want to know that but I also want to know how many of these have got tumour tissue frozen samples uh, and as you can see that sort of limits the number from 448 down to 29. Um, and then if you so desire, you can export that function into CSV files. So this is a sort of legacy hangover from the days when they were posting spreadsheets to each other in the CDs. Um, is that they really like this web application, but actually when it comes down to marking up sheets and sitting down and talking to patients and stuff, they quite like their spreadsheets as well. So he said, yes, we can do that too. Here's a CSV file, so we've got the search function there uh, and the results coming back from that, or you can do an entire dump of all the patients that you have in that registry um, or depending on your security privilege um, or if you want to do some sort of audit checking you can do a wider um, search and export. So as I've talked about this is a virtual research environment so it's not it's more than just a web application um, and these are the studies a whole bunch of acronyms that I'll briefly rattle through the studies that are ongoing that are currently working right now looking at different aspects of adrenal cancer uh, and they want to use the registry um, either to provide patients that are interesting for the registry's purpose or they could go and pillage the registry and say there are interesting patients in there that we want to retrospectively um, recruit here. So the first one we're quite heavily involved in is about FIOs um, and it looks at a specific type of malignant FIO. The second one, this adjuvant mitotain is a type of chemotherapy um, that they want to look at its effect on HCC tumors. First map is all about malignant fields as well. Urine act, whoa, okay, five minutes, <laughs> is about uh, urine analysis for HCC in NAPACA, and Damien is about tumor imaging uh, and the different types of radionuclides to look at um, whether they work or not in filling these tumors out. So we're involved in the PMP study. We've actually provided the ECRS for this as well. And what I wanted to show here, so these are much more rigorous. So we're looking at much more complicated and uh, focused data input uh, with biochemical assessments as the example I show here. We've got different types of units that you need to convert between. So you do the input at the top and the conversions are shown at the bottom, or you do it in one shot in a spreadsheet file in the middle there. 
um, more sort of, uh, again, more rigorous and focused um, genetic menus that you want to see the exact expressions of the genes that are affected by COs. Uh, and you can transfer it between the NSAT registry and the PMT study, and this is an example of that. Um, and again, you see the listing of patients, and one of the key points is that this ID is similar to what was in the NSAT registry, so that's what hangs it all together. The Vadiuvo, this was a legacy study that um, we plug into by using web service connectivity. So you've got the NSAT registry database there, you've got the Vadiuvo uh, database there for their study. They assign an ID, this ID gets checked against the um, the ID storage in the NSAT registry, which has an event clock of IDs that we hand out per center, that gets sent back to Adiugo. And once you do that, you can transfer data between the Adiugo database and the NSAT database. Um, important considerations are like ethics approval for this project. Uh, we had to do that for each country. And we've got a document that's quite full and comprehensive. They were all approved. Um, and that's very important for follow-on studies that once you've done it once, people are quite happy to, um, you know, provide funding to do it again. Uh, the data types and value, biomaterial value and imaging uh, data are very valuable, but also clinical annotations for papers and things. About two months ago, someone discovered a new gene, the MAX gene, for, that was involved in pheochromocytoma study. And I suddenly got about three or four people saying, how do I download these all my information about fields from the registry, so I had to give them little one-on-one -on -one tutorial for this paper that was being produced. So the value there is quite high. I've talked about the um, summaries of the stamps already, uh, and this is a newsletter that I sort of send around every quarter saying this is the registry usage and stuff, so it engenders this kind of community feeling as well. Um, infrastructure that's connected through IDs, you've got center ID, patient ID, and sample IDs, so that's tumors, plasmas, whatever. Um, Non-identifying, very important, so that ethics are kind of proven and everything. That gets printed out, stuck on some tubes, um, and sent and exchanged between the centers. Um, and the printout function here is that you click a button in the registry and it shows an RTF file that uses that ID, um, and that's what you can print on the tubes. And all the basic sort of IT stuff that underpins it is a map of Germany showing usage and it's getting hammered in Munich. Um, data size, it's about 2,000 records we've got in there. This is currently tens of megabytes of data transfer for backups and dumps and things. But once the imaging files come online, that will impact that massively. And all the regular security things, SSL, client certificates, bytecode, SQL injection, session protection, times out after 15 minutes, hash passwords, and separate account databases. I'll go through the backup slide quickly. Uh, just shows you do MySQL dump from the database into a file system, transfer it to another machine, and then offsite backups are encrypted. So if one machine goes down, you've got the second, first machine, second machine goes down, you've got the original, and if the meteorite hits Melbourne, then you've still got the offsite encrypted backups. And ongoing and future work, we want to develop the security policy so it's more configurable, more authorization control, more fine-grained. Uh, we want to monitoring platforms, so all the information that we have right there right now is who, what, when, and where, but the why is very important. We want to know why data was changed, when it was, um, and that's important for study validation. And we want to add in more data for new contributing centers, um, such as part of a Berlin, Turin, Florence, and Budapest. So the Real Cancer Registry, it's been used heavily. Uh, it's available for further contributions to studies. The ethics procedure, that's very important, and that's been achieved for many countries. Um, the accountability enforced by EU FP7 projects, I've got to mention this because it's a favorite sort of point of mine, is that a lot of academic projects, they're not focused, but if you have a yearly review where you're quite solidly grilled and it's said, you know, what did you do? Um, you produce very useful stuff that um, people will use quite heavily, um, so I always like to get that point in there. And the European Science Foundation also um, provides sort of extra funding and support for endeavors such as this. And I think that's it. So thank you very much. Any questions? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it's um, we're doing that a lot. We're doing sort of bulk data uploads. Like we're right now, we're going to each centre and we're still bringing in sort of old legacy these spreadsheets, these very big spreadsheets that we want to bring in um, to that. So that would be part of that process. Um, we haven't found the limits of that yet, uh, but I suspect when that imaging study comes online, that's the point where we'll look at data performance and um, looking at high-scale data transfer and upload. Um, we'd need to get a feel for the kind of numbers that people want to upload um, before I could answer that properly. But yes, I'm aware of it, and it would be an issue when it comes to that. Okay, I think um, that looks like it. There's a token of our appreciation from the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you.